This conference will now be recorded. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Innovation Groups webinar series. I am Prashant Pandey, consultant with Innovation Groups. Today we have Sujipta Lehri, head of engineering and products at D Digital. He will be talking about quantitative analysis for systematic waste reduction. Before starting the webinar, let's uh, look at what. In, let me introduce you to Innovation Groups. We'll look into the web, webinar logistics, and then I'll hand over to Sudipta. Innovation Roots. Innovation Roots is a leading training and consulting service provider and publisher of research-driven content, designers and res design and resources. Our motto is to create things of great value through self-education and continuous learning. We provide solutions to futuristic organizations, world-class agile transformation coaching, assessment, training, and consulting services proven scrum framework coaching and training for product development teams full range of one month courses and advisory for improving and optimizing workflow develop devops consulting training and transformation services for better development deployment and release cycles webinar logistic please use a lan cable for joining this webinar wifi connections are unstable use high quality speakers or headphones for better sound quality. Please keep your mic microphones muted. Questions will be taken via question Q and A ch chat box. Please enter your questions in the chat box. The webinar, webinar will be recorded. Subscribe to the YouTube channel Innovation Books to find recording. Slides will be made available on SlideShare. We appreciate your cooperation. Over to you, Sudipta. Thanks, Prashant. Uh, can you guys see my screen? Yes. Thanks a lot. Let me go to the slideshow mode. So thanks, guys. Friday evening. Uh, let's try and uh, do it and wrap it on time. Uh, so what I thought we'll do today is uh, to speak about how we can use uh, data and quantitative analysis in making uh, a process of continuous uh, improvement possible in any of our projects or our transformation exercises. So that would be the broad scheme of how we would do it. And a, a quick introduction to Digitay before we do that. Uh, we are a two decade old company. We focus on lean agile products. Uh, we have a pretty strong uh, market presence, uh, both in India as well as globally. Uh, if you work in Infosys, HCL, Cognizant, uh, Wipro, uh, LNT, uh, both the LNT twins, um, SunGuard, uh, KPIT. In, if, if you're any of these large IT service uh, companies, in all probability, you know Digitay and you know a Digitay tool. Uh, globally, customers like Optum, Amazon, Vodafone, they are all using our tools in some way or fashion. So we have a pretty global presence, uh, a, a license base of 900,000 uh, users, and we leverage that experience to keep continuously upgrading the capabilities and the feature set that we have in our products. Uh, a quick introduction to myself. Uh, most people call me uh, Sudi. I've been in the industry for about uh, three decades now. Uh, I look after Digitase engineering and uh, product management function. Uh, I also uh, manage the limited web societies uh, in India. We have five chapters in India today. Uh, so I kind of help manage that and, and, and track coordinate the events and whatever goes on in those platforms. Uh, full disclosure before uh, we go full-fledged into it, I will use uh, screenshots from the Swift Kanban tool, which is our flagship uh, Kanban Scrumban tool. Uh, it doesn't mean that these analytics are only possible in this tool. You can obviously do it uh, even something as native as in Excel, but clearly it helps you to have a tool to be able to do that. And some of these could be possible using plugins or other things, if you're using Jira or other tools, I don't know. But at least for the sake of this conversation, I'm going to be using Swift Kanban or 
the snapshots of Swift Kanban to be able to communicate a point. So what do we see? Uh, I don't know about all your individual experiences. This is what I have seen pretty much across the industry where I've gone. Uh, by the way, you do see my Twitter ID uh, down below. If you, uh, if you, if something catches your attention, feel free to to be able to tweet about it. So what we see is most commonly teams work in time boxes, sprints, or whatever. But essentially, they're time box iterations. Uh, they use some kind of boards, uh, often task boards. They do stand-ups, and uh, I think the stand-ups part pretty much most teams that I've seen do the typical scrum format uh, stand up as opposed to the recommended uh, format from the Kanban community. And that's perfectly fine. Uh, teams do pretty regularly retrospectives and I've seen a lot of uh, momentum there. Occasionally I've seen teams being able to keep the froze, uh, scope frozen during the time box. I don't know how many of you are successful in doing that. Uh, I personally am a pretty miserable failure in being able to do that, but uh, but we try and espouse for it as much as we can. Uh, boards that represent the value stream, not just a task board of to-do in progress done. And clearly I think uh, that is perhaps uh, one of the most important uh, success factors for continuous improvement, which is if you really map the value stream and you can you keep on improving and iterating with the value stream that you have. And uh, and occasionally retrospectives actually getting converted into actionables and again actionables getting systematically and methodic, methodic, methodologically closed uh, over a period of time. Uh, I see a fair amount of weakness in the in the systems that at least I look after in that process. Very rarely do we see metric based continuous improvement um, and um, ex implementation of flow and pull. People understand the concept. Uh, I think there are very few teams who perhaps do not understand the concept, but but there are very few teams who actually are able to execute pull based execution. Um, similarly, very few people who actually enforce whip limits. They see the whip limit violations, but they kind of uh, pretty uh, continue to move on and kind of just keep it as an information only. And of course, business that is driven by execution metrics. So what we're going to talk about today is only the first dimension about it, which is metric driven continuous improvement. And we can talk about some of the other topics on another day, but uh, but that's going to be the focus of just the, the rest of the rest of the 50 odd minutes that I have with me today. So we're going to look at what are the things that you can analyze how this can actually lead you to your continuous improvement step. And how if you do that, how if you implement the continuous implement step, you can actually go towards waste reduction. So um, one of the assumptions, the premise as part of this talk is that you have been implementing uh, lean agile uh, in some way. If you are not a, you know, a, like a, a newcomer to the transformation process. Uh, otherwise, it might it might make it difficult for you to kind of appreciate why some of the nuances are as I'm going to talk about. So let's understand waste. Uh, we commonly perceive labor material and capacity as waste, right? So if you go ahead and and if you think that, hey, if if a 10 hour job could be done in 15 hours, why did we take that 15 hours and the five hours is non-productive or, or or it is counterproductive or it's waste and then you kind of hammer your teams around to be able to say hey why did the 10 hours become 15 hours and you will see a lot of typical management discussion reporting uh, root cause analysis around that hey how can we improve productivity how can we uh, do the 10 hours planned job or the estimated job in eight hours and i think there is firstly the question is not not wrong I think the question is about how much time and energy does, man, does, does management spend in focusing on that point. And I will highlight uh, quite a few things uh, around in the rest of the session today, why that's a complete, uh, completely counterproductive effort. What we need to focus on is to focus on non-value add activity. And we will talk about that for, for the bulk of the session today, how to identify non-value add activity. Now, 
we also need to focus on what is the value that we get from any activity, right? So for example, and I'll just uh, spill the beans here. For example, if you're doing activity X in your value stream, am I getting the ROI of, of that, of that uh, activity, right? So for example, if I'm spending on a 10 hour job, if I'm spending 10 hours to write manual test cases, and then 10 hours to write automation, Am I getting the value for it? And I'm the one of the biggest proponents of automation. So, so, so don't get me wrong. I just took an example to kind of mislead you. But my point is, whenever we spend an activity around it, one needs to look about what is the value that I'm getting, what is the ROI for that activity that I'm performing, and and it becomes important to be able to 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 focus on that cost for that activity and and measure it against the value that we are going to deliver. So Ankit asks value in the eyes of, value in the eyes of always in the eyes of the customer. Everything is in lean thinking, everything is from the point of view of the customer. It's not from the point of the team, it's not from the point of the management. Everything is from the point of who's going to use whatever you are going to do. That's a very simple and the easiest definition of value that, that lean uses and it, and it helps us keep our focus correctly in many areas. So waste comes in three forms, and this is very classic um, lean literature. Uh, I'm sure most many of you would have heard it, Muda, Muri, and Mura. Uh, Muda is about essentially identifying activities which are not adding value or spending too much effort for the value that you're gonna get out of it. So that's the classic Mura. Uh, Muri is where essentially you are you're overburdened, you're trying to do too many things, and because you're trying to do too many things, you're either getting overburdened, over, uh, over stressed out, you're not able to spend adequate time, and your quality is going down. So a whole bunch of related problems around uh, what happens when you're not able to do something correctly with the time that it needs to be done. And the last but not the least, Mura, which is controlling the variability in flow. Now, and controlling variability in flow is effectively means process control, getting the process variations under control. So many of the many of the people who have been in the industry, um, as I as I said, I've been there for for several decades now. Uh, many of uh, uh, many of the people who have uh, who have been in the industry are familiar with efforts around uh, Six Sigma, and clearly, uh, uh, clearly. That was one of the first initiatives that the industry took in being able to, to implement process control, trying to get a handle about around process variations, identifying the root cause of the process variations, trying to, to define control limits, and then trying to bring down the root causes of the control limits and, and get the process under control. So that was, I think, the first tenets of actual lean thinking as applied in the at least in the IT services industry, and this is at, at least two decades back. This has got nothing to do with lean agile. I think Indian IT services started adopting uh, Six Sigma practices way way ahead of time compared to the maturity in the rest of the industry that was available in the software development industry at that point of time. So, moving on. So one of the first things that I want to talk about is and this might be a pretty game changer is are we work on the right are we working on the right thing now uh, and if you are not working on the right thing now should we working on something else now uh, pardon my typo there uh, and we'll spend a little bit of time because i have not seen anybody doing it so what's what's a what's a question that often product managers and product owners try to try to understand uh, they understand how important is something needs to be done. So they try and understand, uh, do some kind of prioritization to say, hey, should I be doing work item A or should I be doing work item B? And there are different methods, different techniques, uh, as simple as a simple rank order prioritization uh, to obviously using a little more sophisticated methods uh, like the trained agile guys have in what they call as the WSJF method or what the Kanban uh, uh, community uh, preaches in terms of being able to do uh, multi-dimensional risk-based prioritization, uh, which I think is a little more mature process and a little less uh, 
uh, subjective or it is subjective but a little more um, I think uh, powerful than the classic WSJF method but I think they all miss one key point and the key point is that the question often that we get from the businesses when can I get it when can you guys give the, deliver this back to me and I keep telling my teams that the that, that one needs to flip around the question and ask when do you need it it doesn't matter when can I get it? When can I get it is a trick question because it's a question that teams are being our our managements are using in more often than not to be able to of course first understand when they can make their make the business priorities business commitments, but also quite often they are using that as a time to understand how long it will take you and reverse flip it back to understand how much pressure they need to put on you to be able to get it done sooner because there is a Parkinson uh, philosophy that hey if I don't put the time pressure then the team will be slack and they will take more time than perhaps they can they actually need so the flip way to ask the question around from a product management perspective is to say when do you need it and when do you if you, if you get an answer when do you need it you're forcing your business to think really saying hey in the scheme of rest of the things when do we really need this compared to all the other things when we do need it so you will you're forcing them to really think a lot deeper and better in terms of what how they actually need to prioritize and what do they need by when now once you know when you need it you can of course do a simple due date based tracking right you can just say hey this is the due date and you can see if uh, you know that if you're like within one week of the due date or within one month of the due date and you know that you have not even started the work you obviously know you're going to fail and therefore you can then uh, start preparing your business side accordingly about hey you're going to slip it or act internally what you need to do the other more mature way of doing it and which is the more quantitative way of doing it is that you can determine the likely date of completion and if the likely date of completion of the card is more than when you need need it then of course you need you need to figure out what to do about it right you can then need to figure out that hey do I should I ignore it should I highlight this to my business what is the criticality of this so you can act you can you can once you know that your forecast date for getting this work completed is later than the date that the business needs it you now at least are aware of what something that needs to be done what needs to be done and we'll talk about it but you at least know that this needs to be taken up correct now what is this based on right how do we determine the forecast of a particular work item and the forecast for the work item is for people who do flow based systems and flow based tracking is you essentially go ahead and do what is called a simple lead time distribution you kind of take all your past cards that have flown through the value stream you plot their lead time and you will see a spread which is something like this and this spread is very different from a typical bell curve or your gaussian distribution this 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 spread is unique in in what you see that the modal value is less than the median is, is is less than the the median value and is less than the mean value so if you just use an average for planning like we do in most cases it's mathematically and fundamentally incorrect because it has been shown consistently time and again that in the software development business cycle time lead time distribution takes a pattern like this these are called viable distributions and they have a long tail which kind of skews the mean and the medium away from the modal modal is nothing but the most frequented uh, value and median is of course the 50 percent value mean is the average as most people understand now if you know that this is the case that that if you know that hey I'm not going to be able to meet the the due date because my forecast date is far ahead or far later then you need to figure out what you need to do and one of the things that teams that follow scrum on or Kanban do is to reclassify the ticket correct so you could reclassify the ticket from what's called as a standard priority or standard class of service to an expedite class of service and if you have an expedite if, if you reclassify that ticket to an expedite class of service 
you will from from based on your own lead time distribution of expedited cards cards which have a higher level of priority you would then be able to go ahead and see hey how i can suddenly make my due date happen right so if you are tracking your card attributes and if you are tracking them for lead time distribution then you can see which of the typical reclassification of the parameters or reclassification of the ticket would make the workflow differently and faster. Now mind it, when I'm saying reclassification, I'm not saying the work item changes. You still need to do what you need to do. If it's expected to take 20 hours, it will still, still take 20 hours. But what you're reclassifying are the prioritization and the pull criteria to be able to decide what goes first over another. What will you take up ahead of another curve? Okay, another card. So you can reclassify based on what meets your criteria and hopefully you will find one criteria that will bring you back to, to be able to complete the card within the forecast day or uh, within the due date. So the important thing therefore is to understand that in an environment where demand is greater than supply for most of us, right? Most of us, there are way too many things that need to be done compared to what we're able to deliver. If this is not the case, then you can ignore this problem. But reality is, from whatever I know of every team that I've seen, demand is uh, exceeds supply. And if you know that you can finish this card sooner than when you need it, so if I can take card A and card A finishes sooner than when I need it, then you can actually delay its start. And what you can do is you can stop this card and pick up another card. So just because you have a high priority card and a medium priority card, but if your lead time for the high priority card says that you can get it done within the due date comfortably, then you can say, hey, let me hold it back. I can then pick up on this medium priority card where my past track record says that I need more time so I can hold this, I can take the medium priority card and, and take that up first so that I have the potential to finish the medium priority card and give it within the due date, meet its expert business outcome, as well as take the high priority card after that and then complete that also within the within the due date. So you can deliver more and better outcomes. You can maximize the opportunity potential by understanding the distribution and what time it has taken you in the past, comparing it with the forecast date that uh, that the system is telling you and the due date that you need from the, that, that, that you have from the business and reassessing whether you can hold on a particular card and pick up another card in the meantime. Now, how do we improve? Obviously, this means that you have to be dependent upon the data, right? You have to be, you have to have very good quality data. And the data is obviously as good as how minimal is the spread, correct? The more and the longer the spread is, the more is the potential of being out of the forecast and your forecast going wrong because your spread is too long. So one of the things that you can do is you can set thresholds on the card. You can set thresholds on the card to the mod modal value and to the mean value. And you can try and encourage your teams that, hey, finish the cards within the modal value as much as you can, right? And worst case scenario, take it and try and finish it within the mean value. This, the more you can finish your cards within the modal and the mean value, the more the the more the distribution curve will shift towards the left and this spread will keep narrowing because cards are more and more finishing. So it will go like this and it will start finishing sooner. So your spread is narrowing because you're spreading them, you're, you're finishing them in a tighter period of time. So it helps to be able to use tools where you can, you, where, where you can set your thresholds and then track your aging compared to the thresholds. And obviously, once you're past the, past the mean, you know that this card is going to keep on making my spread worse and worse. And therefore, yes, it becomes important at that point of time that all things uh, considered and, and, and equal, I need to pick this, art, uh, pick, pick this card 
first because this will deteriorate the quality of data that I'm going to be able to use for my forecast future prediction later. So with that, we have talked about the first key thing, which is, do we know what we're working on now? And do we need to work on this specific card now? Or can we reprioritize and to work on something else based on an estimation of how long it's going to take me? Let me move to the second item and the second item is of is around estimation now we all need estimation I don't think uh, there is a certain level of estimation that perhaps is needed it is pretty pretty dramatic to say uh, you don't need estimates completely though I am one of the strong proponents of that school of thought but the more important thing that I want to spend time today is that we often spend a lot of effort in trying to get a very accurate estimate and the question is, is it worth it? Um, many of the thought leaders often say that the first thing that should come to you whenever you hear a statement that wish we had more time to plan, the minute you know that somebody is saying wish you had more time to plan, somebody has got a different mindset. Somebody has got a mindset that perhaps needs to be uh, discussed and, and seen how can we make them look at it and look at the problem differently. Because you will never have enough time to plan enough it will the plan will be proven wrong as pretty much as soon as you start working around it so one of the concepts that that the kanban community talks about and this is very purely from the kanban community is measuring flow efficiency now flow efficiency is nothing but in any value stream there are a sequence of steps and the sequence of steps have some steps which are where work is happening and some steps where work is waiting and flow efficiency measures the ratio of the time that the work items spent in working compared to the total lead time the total time that it took right so it's measured as a simple work time by lead time it's as 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 elementary and simple as that the problem is that in most cases in real life when you start and if you're not really thinking about a flow based system the flow efficiencies are ridiculously low they're shockingly low um, it, it it is not uncommon at all to see flow efficiency in in teens and you can see them in single digits believe me if you have, if you see something more than 40 percent it is well it's like shockingly good for a good reason and i think experience will tell you now this doesn't mean that people are idle it's not it does not mean that people are idle and work is not getting done it is just that work is not getting done on that single card on the card that we're looking at right now that card is waiting because people are doing too many other things at the same point of time. So very typically high whip results in low flow efficiency. And this is a simple plot of, of, uh, of our own development team. And if you see here for the longest time, we, we hovered around, we, we started from uh, below 20% flow efficiency, went up to uh, you know uh, around 25 percent for the longest time and then over a period of time kind of were able to take it 40 percent and i can i can actually demonstrate with data that actual flow efficiency would even be half of this it would not even be the numbers that you're showing for a for a variety of reasons that i can explain a little later if somebody has inquisitiveness the point that i want you to retain is that in real life flow efficiency is sub 20 25 percent for sure in most cases unless you are running extremely high flow efficiency systems now what does that mean so what it means is that if your flow efficiency is just hypothetically speaking 25 percent and your lead time is 100 days it means your working time is only 25 days right so if the working time is 25 days and waiting time is 75 days then it makes very little sense to spend a lot of effort in trying to estimate whether the 25 days should have could have been 20 days or 30 days or 15 days right because what the heck it is just an estimate at the beginning of the right to begin with number one and number two is as a percent of the total it even if you make it five days more accurate it means nothing because you're not going to be able to significantly make a dent on the actual lead time it makes far more business sense to actually figure out hey how could i reduce the waiting time by whatever person that you could so it makes far more sense to focus on 
the system on on the throughput of the card which is the overall lead time that the card takes and if the overall lead time of the card takes includes a significant percentage of it as waiting time then it definitely makes a lot more sense to be able to see how you can reduce that compared to spending more and more effort in trying to get an accurate estimate so do a quick estimation for a high level planning once again i'm not saying do zero estimate uh, lean thinking is very clear estimation is a waste it is just that we might want to consider it as an essential waste but it is a waste and therefore the least amount of time spent to get the the level of estimation that would help us do a basic level of planning that would be adequate for the purpose so we covered two things we covered the first thing that we covered was trying to understand what to pick up next and are we working on the right thing now uh, and the second key area that i've seen uh, where i see unfortunately a lot of waste is around estimation and not just estimation it is estimation and then negotiation on the estimation and then people sugar coating on the estimation and then so you going to your management and management beating you down and then the customer beats you down so it's a it's a continuous cycle of negativity that happens uh, because everybody knows that the estimation process is going to be kind of gamed, gamed around with. So let me move around with one more uh, area that you commonly see I, uh, is, is on aborted cards. I don't know, again, uh, for, for many of us in the product industry, and especially when the product cycles are pretty dynamic, uh, lots of customers giving feedback on a very continual basis, we do keep experiencing situations where we start working on an item um, and then we have to abort on the item because the customer changed their mind. And clearly that's a, that's a, that's a reason of waste that you could well avoid. Uh, and clearly you can do some level of analysis of the reasons why you have to abort cards. And depending upon what kind of volatility, requirement volatility that you have from your business, uh, you could see much higher values than what I see in uh, within Digitay itself. Um, Everybody talks and knows about uh, reducing uh, work in progress, WIP limits. Uh, very clearly, WIP limits is directly, reducing WIP limits is directly linked to reducing overload, overburdening, and congestion. I think that is well established. What I think is important is to have tools that can actually help you track the WIP. What I've seen is often that, that the WIP gets hidden around across a lot of data spread across systems or around physical boards. So for example, if you're having multiple boards, physical multiple boards, and you have teams that are shared around uh, across multiple projects or shared resources like, like DB design team members, database people, uh, automation people, stuff like that. If you have a lot of shared resources who are sharing across teams and these teams are, have physical boards, you really have no clue at one point of time of what is the whip of that individual. So it helps to have tools that can actually qualify and, and, and identify for you who are the people who have way too high whip on their system, on their name, because you know nothing is going to get done. The next one, which is which is perhaps with teams which have uh, which which have started looking into the value stream, is what is called as a capacity whip limit, which is where the time to say, hey, I have a team of 10 people, so let me not pick up more than 15 cards. And to do what is called as a basic capacity whip uh, tracking uh, so that they are able to at least at the system level ensure that the system doesn't get overburdened, though it doesn't really help in the sense that you could still find everything being stuck in, let's say, a system testing lane because everybody is stuck out there and your cards were not split independently and therefore everything is getting stuck at the system testing lane. Nothing can move past system testing lane. So it helps to some extent in ensuring that the people are not just going on blindly dumping on the team, but to be able to track and show the whip at the, at the, at the team level, at the capacity level, helps you to at least make sure that you can go back to the business and say, hey, we just have too many work items for what we need to do at this point of time. Clearly, we are not going to be able to do this. We need some time before we actually can get 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 this condition relieved and then carry on. And last but not the least, which is what most uh, tools track pretty easily, which is the value stream uh, stage based WIP limits, which is where you actually um, track 
how many cars are there on a particular column. I wouldn't spend enough time on it. it I think most, most of you would be aware of it, except to say, as I said, I've seen very little enforcement. And, and, and as long as there is no enforcement, it really doesn't help the cause. It doesn't help the cause. It doesn't relieve the condition. It doesn't cause collaboration to understand what is creating the bottleneck at that point of time and what and, and, and how can teams from upstream come down to help the downstream to be able to relieve the condition and make it move forward. So for teams that are tracking this, great. But I would say, please do enforce your WIP limits so that you're actually able to get the business benefit of improving your flow and throughput by enforcing the WIP limit. That is why we implement WIP limits, not just to know that there is congestion in the system. So you can actually uh, uh, you can actually look back on the system and there are uh, uh, tools like ours as an example. I don't know how many others are there, but my guess is there might be some a few others also that would help you to actually see where your congestion is happening. You can actually see the, the value stream stages where congestion is happening. You can actually see the people where where WIP is building up. You can see, for example, in, in our example, Rahul is building up the work in uh, progress in his name. And there could be very valid reasons. I'm not saying that these are invalid reasons, but clearly if you apply theory of constraints or if you think of theory of constraints, you know that the system throughput is only as good as the choked uh, value stream stage. And so therefore, if your choked value stream stage is only able to give a throughput of, let's say five cards per week, you're not going to be able to have a system throughput more than five, no matter how many people you throw around in the rest of the value stream, right? So it becomes extremely valuable to understand over a period of time, where are your constraints and where are your bottlenecks developing and what you can then do to be able to resolve these. Given that first you know where it is happening, and I think that is most important because in most cases, I think people are pretty unaware of where do these bottlenecks happen in their day-to-day -day execution system. So we have talked about Muda, we have talked about Muri overburdening. Let's talk a little bit about process control. Now, this is perhaps a little more easy for most teams, uh, specifically in the Indian IT industry, because we are used to control charts. Uh, but if you're used to control charts, you uh, or if you have control charts in your tools, you should use them to be able to analyze the, to, uh, the cards that went above your upper control limit or your to the lower control limit, which is nothing but your three sigma deviation from the mean, and then understand what caused the deviation. So for example, you can see the detailed analysis that, that one can see here. And you can see here in this as many small example that, hey, there was a blocker in the blocker in the design lane of, of 13 days. So out of a total 37 days, it was blocked in the design lane. And then you can do, of course, a root cause analysis to understand what happened. So it helps you to first identify uh, which is the, well, sorry, it first helps you to identify which is the card uh, where the blocker happens. For example, you can actually highlight on a card where the, where the, where the thresholds were, were deviated and then drill down on that card and understand what happened on that specific card. And of course, then do a root cause analysis around that. Now, another, another uh, visual that I've seen often uh, being very useful is being able to track and see how over a period of time your lead time in different stages of the value stream changes. So you can see as an example that for whatever reason here, the uh, this this value stream in this example, uh, the product owner acceptance and demo took a ridiculous amount of time compared to the earlier time buckets, right? And clearly then you need to be able to understand what happened here, what caused this sudden um, deviation. For another example, you can see here is that these are our, uh, this, these are our upstream lanes, right? Design, <coughs> design and uh, NFR, non-functional uh, design, and then your test case drafting. You can see that in the initial stages of the value stream, there was very little time that the cards were spending on these activities. Now it has become a lot better, but you can st still see that the that the non-functional, the NFR analysis, where you were, you where you did want teams to spend time. That is why you actually 
carve that out explicitly in the value stream because you must have had a reason to say, hey, cards must go through a non-functional requirement analysis stage. But clearly, even though you've put them in the value stream, cards are not spending enough time on that. So you can look at this kind of data, understand the regular patterns, understand the variations in the patterns. In this case, I would say that the trend about the card spending more time in analysis and design is great, whereas the <coughs> deviation as to why it spent a more amount of time here in the PO acceptance and demo would be something that needs to be looked into or, and, and, and analyzed in terms of what happened there. Another very uh, similar uh, visualization that can actually help to understand uh, process deviations as well as Mura is, for example, if you see this, the green line indicates the work, uh, the work time and the blue line indicates the wait time. And you can see that there are several instances here where the blue line is above the green line, which just indicates that for the card, for the cards which happened in that duration, the wait time was higher than the work time. And so what you can do is obviously, once you know that, <laughs> Excuse me. Once you know that, yes, there are periods of time where the wait time is higher than the work time, uh, you can actually, again, deep dive into it, do the kind of a playback that I showed to you earlier, and be able to retrospect and understand what caused that deviation and, and what caused that pattern of work to happen. So you can see here lead times. Are, very interestingly, you can see from this example that whenever the wait times uh, wait times increase, the lead times the obviously increase correspondingly, which is obvious, right? I mean, if you are having a lot of time when the wait time, when the cards are spending waiting, obviously the lead time on those cards will keep on increasing. So higher lead times compared to what you might be mentally thinking or expecting often indicates wait time more than what, what you would like to be in the system. So in closing, uh, what I wanted to highlight is that it's important to not just execute as per lean and agile. It is important to also understand uh, how you can, imp uh, what is happening, what is the data telling you, and do your retrospectives and root cause analysis that is driven by the data, that, 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 that uses the data. It is often a lot more revealing and it is often a lot more counterproductive than uh, and counterintuitive than what people would generally think otherwise. So use data as a basis for that. Number two, make that data a part of your management reporting. The one of the, often I see a, a regular complaint which is, hey, or our senior executives are not really into it. They don't buy into it. They don't understand. They don't know why we do it. Or they're not into it. They, they just don't care. I've seen a, a material change when you start reporting in your quarterly reviews, in your status reviews, data from these Lean Agile tools. Because when you start showing them the data from the Lean Agile tools, they will start asking you questions around that. They will try to understand what is the, what is the data showing? Why is it something like that that way? So if you go and tell a senior executive, hey, we are running at flow efficiency of 30%, you will suddenly see them stand up and recognize and say, hey, what's, what does it mean? What is flow efficiency? What do you mean when you say we just have a flow efficiency of 30%? Then you can have the follow-up question around why? Why is only 30%? What can we do to make it better? So you can have a lot more better involvement and, and, and participation from your the leadership in execution, in your lean agile execution, if you present to them the data, and even if the data is not looking good, loop them in so that you can get them involved in the process of improving that data. Last but not the least, don't depend on vanity metrics. And the best example that I uh, keep referring to are, are any example around uh, around story points or uh, you know yeah classic story point or effort driven metrics, effort driven throughput. And the simple reason is they are gamed, right? If you go ahead and and make your teams do story point estimation, and then you and and then you're tracking a throughput of 
velocity based on the story point, uh, clearly uh, there will be some pressure from the management over a period of time to keep improving the throughput. And, and, and beyond a certain point, they will not be able to do that. When, when they're not going to be able to do that, they're going to be essentially left uh, either gaming the system or uh, you know or yeah or or kind of manipulating the data in a manner so that they can still account the data so it kind of defeats the entire intent of lean agile execution and that what you were trying to do right building transparency building trust all that gets vitiated when you start uh, reporting uh, vanity metrics that can often lead to the wrong questions um, wrong questions and often at the wrong time so so please avoid uh, vanity metrics there is a lot of the other data that you can show i have obviously shown some examples today um, and i have not even gone into areas around metrics that you can track from your devops tools or from your automation tools uh, coverage tools um, i have not even even gone there um, that's a completely uh, another subject, but you can use data from a variety of these kind of tools to be able to present how your execution is improving, both from a delivery management perspective as well as from an engineering perspective. So that's what I had today uh, for my uh, presentation, and I do believe I have a reasonable amount of time left for any uh, questions that you guys might have, and I would be happy to take them if. Uh, if there are any. Uh, Rajesh tells me that you wanted me to make you the presenter. I'm sorry, I could not at that point of time, not sure if you wanted to share something or highlight a specific point. Are there any other questions uh, today? Hello. Anybody have any questions for today? Thanks, guys. Uh, let me uh, end it here, and uh, and hopefully it helped. If you do want to reach out to me, you you do have my contact details there. Uh, would be very happy to uh, um, share whatever uh, insights and learnings that I have, and would be happy to hear your experiences and. Uh, and your insights too. Thanks a lot. Take care. Bye bye. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Thanks, everybody.